Next, we move to the adrenal hormones. These would be hormones that are released from the adrenal glands. I've already discussed this, but just as a quick reminder that we actually have two uh, different regions within the adrenal gland itself, and, and so can actually classify them as two different uh, endocrine tissues if we wished to. The tissue in the center is the adrenal medulla, and that is composed of, as you can see from this picture, the blue and the red represent the capillaries, and the remaining tissue are neurons that have been specialized and modified. So they're not the type of neurons that you think of where you think cell body, dendrites, um, long axon, and nerve terminal, but they are instead modified to do their function, which is to release epinephrine. The outer gland is, the, uh, the outer portion of the gland is that adrenal cortex that I mentioned. And the adrenal cortex is rich in cells, epithelial cells, but if you were to cl take a very close look at this adrenal cortex, what you would see is cells that are just packed full of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Now, why smooth endoplasmic reticulum? Because that smooth endoplasmic reticulum is responsible for synthesizing lipids. And the adrenal cortex does, in fact, synthesize lipids. In fact, it makes so many lipids that it's yellowish in color. Not what I meant to do. Uh, yellow is in color because of the lipids that are present there and the cholesterol and the fatty acids that are abundant in this area. There are more than 24 steroid hormones that are produced by the adrenal cortex and collectively they're referred to as corticosteroids. Now these corticosteroids are critical, vital to maintaining life. We actually can survive, for example, without thyroid hormone. We're not going to be very happy about it. We're not going to feel very good. Um, but it's not necessarily immediately fatal. It might shorten our life, but it's not going to kill us. Remove the adrenal glands, though, and death will very quickly follow. In fact, in uh, mice, um, there are studies that have been done where we have, in fact, destroyed those adrenal glands. I say we as if I were part of that experiment. I was not, but the scientific community, those who exercised these, did, in fact, remove these adrenal glands, and the mice couldn't handle any kind of stressor at all without, um, without keeling over. And so they're very critical, very necessary for maintaining life. Now, if we look at these adrenal cortex, or, or sorry, if we look at the adrenal cortex and the hormones that are released from it, we can break these hormones down into two different classes. One class is the mineral corticoids, and the other class is the glucocorticoids. Looking at the mineral corticoids first, there's quite a few of them, but the primary mineral corticoid that we are interested in in this class and that we will talk about in this class is this one here, and it's called aldosterone. Now, aldosterone, unlike, um, unlike other hormones that are released by the adrenal cortex, aldosterone is not really under the control of the pituitary at all. It is regulated instead by a different mechanism. We are going to revisit this mechanism in great detail um, in a la later section for this class, but I will briefly go over this mechanism with you. What regulates the release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex is two things. Well, actually, let me say three things. If potassium levels are elevated in the bloodstream, aldosterone will be released from the adrenal cortex. Why? Because the adrenal, the, because aldosterone actually increases the loss of potassium in the urine. And so if potassium in the bloodstream is too high, what better way to get rid of it than pee it out? And so that's essentially what's going to happen. We're going to remove this potassium, and aldosterone is the trigger for that. Aldosterone controls that process. One of the other signals is low sodium concentration. If we don't have enough sodium concentration in the blood, if, if we just don't have enough salty blood, um, once again, aldosterone will be released to fix the problem. 
And the reason for that is aldosterone reabsorbs sodium. Now we do have a problem in that these two functions are inseparably linked. We cannot reabsorb sodium without also secreting potassium or excreting potassium. And we cannot excrete potassium without also reabsorbing sodium. So keep that in mind and we'll go into more detail on that, but just be aware of that. The other mechanism that regulates aldosterone release is something called the reno, renin angiotensin II system. Okay, and we are gonna look at that. You can't even read that when I write that, sorry, we'll erase it. Um, we're, we're gonna look at this in much greater detail again a little later on, but renin is a chemical molecule that is released from the kidneys in response to low blood pressure. So when blood pressure drops, so let me write this in, low BP, that will stimulate the release of this renin, and renin in, tin in turn um, catalyzes a chemical reaction, which catalyzes another chemical reaction, which catalyzes another chemical reaction, and ultimately all of the sum of this response is to elevate blood pressure by stimulating part one, the release of aldosterone. Aldosterone absorbs the sodium and water comes with it, thanks to osmosis. And when you add water to the bloodstream, it increases blood volume. And when you increase blood volume, you increase blood pressure. That's not the only thing that the renin aldosterone uh, angiotensin system does, but for now, we're gonna leave it at that. And so uh, these are very important processes for regulating this aldosterone, which in turn regulates blood osmolarity through the sodium and potassium levels. Now, all of this will be inhibited. Aldosterone is prevented, let me highlight this, uh, when blood osmolarity is high, or at least normal to high, I should say. And so once we reach these homeostatic levels or elevated levels of sodium and potassium, we're going to inhibit the release of aldosterone. And if I were to draw this, these guys, this particular picture used the da dashed line to represent inhibition. I would probably prefer this symbol, but regardless, it both means the same thing. It's an inhibitory signal that suppresses the release of the al aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. Now, I do wanna comment on why we care. What's the so what? What's the big deal? Sodium and potassium are both very important ions for regulating the um, electrical properties of a cell. And if these get out of whack, we can have a lot of bad things happen. Neurons rely on sodium and potassium concentrations to generate electrical signals. So our neurons will go haywire. The heart also relies on sodium and potassium to generate the electrical signals that lead to contraction. So our heart's gonna go a little crazy. Skeletal muscle, same deal. So losing homeostasis with these ions, sodium, cal uh, potassium, and calcium, can all cause very serious life-threatening problems. And so we regulate it, and we have, as you see, a number of different mechanisms to regulate it, calcitonin, parathyroid hormone to regulate that calcium levels and the calcitrol from the kidneys, aldosterone to regulate the sodium and potassium levels. We're also going to talk a little bit about antidiuretic hormone and um, all of these together will work together to make sure our ion concentration in the blood is exactly where it needs to be so that those neurons will work correctly. And the heart, also important. All right. The next class of hormones that we release are those glucocorticoids. And of these glucocorticoids, the primary, uh, again, this is another situation where we actually have a fairly large number of hormones that fit into this glucocorticoid class. And rather than list all of them, I'm going to identify uh, a couple of the ones that are the most important. And mostly I'm going to focus on this cortisol cortisol. We also have corticosterone, ster sorry, corticosterone, and then the liver will actually produce some cortisone. You might recognize this one. 
sold in the drugstore as a cream that you can put on the top of your skin to reduce, to control, so this is sold over the counter, over the counter, um, to stop itching. Especially when that itching occurs due to a rash. Maybe you got into some poison ivy. Maybe you got some mosquito bites and they're driving you nuts. You can put a little dab of this corticosteroid on there. Maybe you've got some other kind of rash going on. Things are nuts and you're scratching the heck out of yourself. Cortisone, cortisone uh, can be used to stop the itching. And the reason for that is because itching actually comes from our immune system. Our immune system secretes this bugger here. Don't worry, histamine does some good things too. It's not just the bad guy, but this is the itchy molecule. This makes us itch, okay? It also makes our eyes water and our nose drip and it's unpleasant and we don't like it, but we actually need it. It's gonna play a very important role in the immune system and I will talk about what that role is but for now, in this context, histamine is what causes itching, okay? So these glucocorticoids, what do they do? Well, first let's unpack this word, gluco. Uh, I'm hoping your brain's going, uh, hey, glucose, because growth hormone was a glucose sparing molecule, so is cortisol. Cortisol will elevate blood glucose levels that's a huge, huge job. It increases the rate of glucose, gluconeogenesis, and releases that glucose. That should say gluco. Yeah, let's try to rewrite that. That would be nice if I actually wrote it the correct way. So it increases the rate of gluco, glucose, gluconeogenesis and not glycogen formation but glycogen breakdown both of these processes will release free glucose into the bloodstream elevating that blood gl glucose now in addition to the glucose cortisol is also going to cause proteins to be broken down in the skeletal muscle. Think about that for a second. We're gonna break these proteins down. Why? Specifically so that we can get amino acids, these lovely little amino acids, and release them in the blood. Well, now why on earth would we want to do that? Um, well, interestingly enough, because the liver can use these for gluconeogenesis. They can also use them to make something called ketones, which can help our body, um, specifically our neurons, during times of starvation or when we're doing some kind of um, low-carb diet. Uh, we're still not done. Cortisol is still not done. Not done. It's also going to promote the release of lipids from adipose tissue. Are you noticing a trend here? Didn't we just talk about this with growth hormone? Look, they work together. They work together uh, sometimes. If they're both present in the blood, we're gonna have more glucose present in our bloodstream. But even if we just have glucocorticoids, we will have more glucose in our blood. Why the lipids? Yeah, our good friend, the liver. You know, the liver's an amazing organ and I really wish we dedicated an entire system to, or an entire lecture for the liver because it does so many cool things. Um, but yeah, it's going to use those lipids also for the formation of ketones and uh, gluconeogenesis. And to synthesize molecules, um, both amino acids and lipids, other types of molecules can th that can feed into the Krebs cycle. Um, in addition to just promoting the release of it, we're actually even going to go further and we're going to promote the breakdown. Catabolism, remember, catabolism is to break things apart. The breakdown of the lipids into carbons and hydrogens that can be used as fuel. Uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen complexes that can be used as fuel. And so in addition to the growth hormone process and the glucose sparing effect, cortisol elevates blood glucose. That's why we call it a glucocorticoid. That's why. That's why it's got that name. 
And also very, very important, let's not forget this. This is super important. It's even going to get its own color. We're going to tell you right now cortisol has an anti-inflammatory effect and suppresses the immune system. That's why it suppresses the production of histamine. Histamine is what makes you itch when you get bitten by a mosquito or you get into poison ivy or you have a rash for some other reason. Maybe you're reacting to your laundry soap or something like that. And so it suppresses the immune system. But not only does it suppress the histamine, it will suppress the immune system in general to reduce inflammation. Um, now, you might be wondering, why would we do this? Why would we want to suppress our really super awesome, amazing immune system that saves our butt from the pathogens, disease-causing agents that like to invade us all the time? And um, the answer is that our immune system is sometimes too good. It's really robust and important that we have this amazing immune system, but we also can have problems with it getting out of control. And so cortisol is going to help to control that. And um, it will be released at times of stress and when we're under um, some challenges. So while it might normally regulate the immune system, preventing it from overreacting to things, cortisol also has a rather unfortunate side effect that when we have chronically elevated cortisol levels, we also have a chronic suppressed, suppressed immune system. Mm, sad. Because what this means is when you're stressed, guess what happens? You get sick more easily. You guys know this. You've all done it. I think that even though I'm the teacher, I always, always end up with a cold during finals week. I swear it's like a plot against me. And pretty much half my students do too. Now, that's been a little different now that we're all kind of at home and I don't see anybody. So how am I going to get a cold when I never go outside? But uh, at least previously almost virtually guaranteed to get a cold during finals week because it's a stressful time for both students and teachers. I'm busy trying to catch up on my grading and write an exam and dealing with students that are stressed about their grades and students are of course busy studying and balancing multiple classes and so surprise surprise people get sick. Now You've seen this before, and I really want you to practice using it and learning it and knowing it and understanding it. And, and um, oh, I just remembered. We need to go. No, I'm not going to go back. But making it a part of your, your vocabulary and your process and mind the process. Here we have another example of this negative feedback process and how cortisol is going to be controlled. So glucocortico glucocorticoid secretion from this adrenal cortex is going to be under the control of the um, CRH that is being released from the hypothalamus. And then that CRH is going to control the release of ACTH being released from the, po the uh, anterior pituitary. And the anterior pituitary is going to control the release of cortisone and look at this. Man, I'm just really good at making all these mistakes. It is not targeting the thyroid hormone. It's targeting the adrenal cortex. Shame on me. All right. So this adrenal cortex, and it's going to have those receptors for ACTH, and it's going to release cortisol and corticosteroid and these other glucocorticoids. And then not surprisingly, look at my feedback pathway. Cortisone is going to control and regulate the release of CRH. Ah, but that's not the only thing regulating CRH. Remember that the hypothalamus is involved in regulating homeostasis and is constantly receiving input and information from all sources of uh, all the different regions of the body. Um, regulating and controlling these different processes and responses. And so some of the signals that go to the hypothalamus include the presence of daylight. 
presence of daylight. Also, any stressors. If we're under stress, yeah, the hypothalamus knows about it. And so, in these cases, these are going to regulate the release of CRH by increasing how much CRH is being released. And if we have more CRH being released, we have more acetyl, uh, ACTH being released. And if we have more ACTH being released, we have more cortisone being released. And so cortisone levels will rise in the blood. Cortisol levels will rise in the blood. And all of these lovely effects that we talked about will be amplified and increase in number. Now, what's not on this page, and I should have put it on this page, and shame on me for not putting this on this page. Um, I did a lot of last minute changes trying to make this better. And obviously, because they were last minute, I didn't proofread them in any way. So mistakes happen. Um, let's just fix these mistakes. It's important in controlling the light, dark cycle or the wake sleeping cycle it's going to work with that melatonin which is released from the penile gland pineal, pineal oh what a lousy speller i am gland and um those are going to control our wakefulness here's how cortisone is going to look for us if we map out a 24-hour cycle in the morning and it generally corresponds to when the sun rises uh, but let's just say seven o'clock eight o'clock in the morning when you would naturally start to wake up and maybe you're an early bird and you're gonna wake up at five o'clock if you're my daughter that's pretty much guaranteed and um, it makes her mom want to cry but anyway in the morning if we were to graph this out we'll start out here and we'll just say that this is going to be, oh, let's say 7 a.m. My cortisol levels will be high. Okay, they're going to be up here. But then as the day progresses, do, 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 kind of drop down. Maybe we eat breakfast. We're going to see a little peak. Do, do, do. We're going to eat lunch. We're going to see a little peak. And maybe a snack. See a little peak. Dinner, a little bit peak. Some of us rally in the evening and we'll see a little bit of a bigger peak. And then down and down and down it goes until it's at the lowest possible level. Okay, this is not really 24 hours, but about 2 a.m., 3 o'clock, something to that effect. And uh, energy levels drop with the drop of the cortisone. So you can, uh, um, a.m. So you can blame that 2 p.m. afternoon slump that we all experience and that desire to have a nap that we all experience as um, being due to cortisone, okay? And then of course, if we were to map up melatonin, well, let's see, I don't know. Sometimes after sun, sunset, melatonin levels are gonna go up, okay? So that you are sleepy and you go to sleep. Now, some of you night owls out there, you're gonna get this burst, okay? And your cortisol levels are gonna go up when it's time for most people to be going to sleep and uh, so you might be more wakeful during the night and in some cases people with some disorders or perhaps people who work the graveyard shift what actually ends up happening is this ends up shifting so that your cortisol levels are low during the morning okay and you sleep and then they start to go up and so that actually takes training that doesn't happen overnight it takes a long time of being on the graveyard shift before that sh that uh, switch occurs and sometimes it doesn't ever completely occur. And so you have disorders with sleep that come with the cortisone. All right. The other hormones of the adrenal cortex, or so the adrenal gland involves the adrenal medulla. And this is going to be your uh, neuroendocrine gland. Put those two words together. It's made out of nervous tissue. And the main hormones that are released from this are primarily epithelial... Uh, <laughs> epinephrine and norepinephrine epinephrine is by far the more abundant of the two we can also cause, call epinephrine adrenaline and norepinephrine is referred to as noradrenaline okay and these bind and we'll talk more about these but these bind what we call an adrenergic 
receptor. Adrenergic. Um, too many vowels there. Um, adrenergic receptor. And that root word adrenaline is found there as well. Okay. Um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, adrenaline, noradrenaline, they're the exact same things. Now, there's slight different chemical variations between norepinephrine and epinephrine, and they actually do have different effects when we look at their mechanism of action. There are actually several different types of adrenergic receptors. There's alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2, beta-3. We'll get into those different varieties, not all of them, but later on in the semester. For right now, just know that it's a tissue-specific effect, which means certain tissues will respond in one way and other tissues will respond in another way. Epinephrine is released in response to acute stress. Let's go back up here. Uh, this is due to chronic stress. So acute stress and chronic stress, acute stress and chronic stress. Now, if we look at the effects of epinephrine in particular, it's actually, we're going to have to go all the way back up here really, really quick. Take a quick, quick peek at this. If we look here, do you remember this part, this little segment right here, this one? Okay. That's under the control of the limbic system and the emotional processes that occur in the limbic system that dictate to the hypothalamus, oh my gosh, I'm scared, or oh my gosh, I'm pissed, or oh my gosh, there's a grizzly bear that's going to eat me and I either need to go kung fu it or I need to run away. Um, I would recommend running away, but I guess if you're a kung fu master, whatever. Um, anyway, so if we go back down here and we look at this, what we end up having is we have a signal that actually comes from the brain, from the hypothalamus itself. Okay, so up here, hypothalamus. That autonomic nervous system processing center sends this information and travels down the spinal cord doo -doo -doo, until it gets to the appropriate autonomic neuro neuron in the autonomic nervous system. Specifically, it's so if we take the autonomic nervous system, I'm going to abbreviate that ANS, autonomic nervous system controls all of the involuntary processes, and we can divide that into the sympathetic and what's called the parasympathetic. We'll go into more detail about this later. Um, I know we haven't talked about nervous system yet, and we certainly haven't talked about the autonomic nervous system. We definitely will. But as this autonomic neuron is activated, we're going to get an action potential that will travel the length of this neuron. And it's going to go to my adrenal cortex, sorry, adrenal medulla, and spit out that epinephrine. And some norepinephrine travels through the capillaries, and it's going to its target destination cells that respond to epinephrine and norepinephrine. Remember, epinephrine vastly outnumbers norepinephrine. So while there is some norepinephrine in there, the majority of this hormone is epinephrine. And in response to this epinephrine being released, the target tissues that are activated include the heart and the blood vessels, the respiratory system, the um, brain, okay? These are all systems that can be targeted and they are going to increase cardiac activity increase respiratory activity increase mental focus it's going to redistribute the blood so that the skeletal muscles get the lion's share of it it's going to take blood away from the skin and the digestive system it's going to increase blood glucose levels there's another hormone that increases blood glucose levels so let's list them off so far we've got growth hormone cortisone cortisol and now we have epinephrine, all that release blood glucose, increase blood glucose levels. Why increase blood glucose levels? Because our skeletal muscles are going to be working hard, running away from the grizzly bear. Um, and we are going to run, and we need ATP, and we need um, a lot of energy for that, and so we are going to need a lot of glucose. So we're going to dump glucose into the blood very rapidly, raising blood glucose levels so that we can get our butts away from that grizzly bear. Um, 
And so these are all processes that occur with epinephrine in response to sympathetic stimulation. So this is a blending of the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, and the endocrine system both. The nervous system, this is the ner neuronal part, and this is the endocrine part. Okay, and so that's important to understand and realize that. We've just talked about two hormones involved in stress. Cortisol for chronic stress, epinephrine for acute stress. And both of those participate together into what we, rec we call the stress response. And we can have situations where both epinephrine and cortisone levels are high. Now I should stipulate that while we definitely release large amounts of epinephrine when we are uh, experiencing something extremely dangerous and frightening and we need to respond right away. Um, but we also can release lower amounts of epinephrine when we're stressed about a final exam that's coming around the corner, about the fight that we had with our significant other, about our um, dog that runs away or our kid that's getting into trouble. We can have these lower levels of epinephrine being released. About a pandemic, hello, uh, we can have lots of epinephrine being released in the short term in lower levels. And additionally, we can have this cortisol as the, the stress remains strong. And so together we get this response to stress. The acute stress is due to the epinephrine and the norepinephrine. Chronic response is due to the corticosteroids, the glucocorticoids. And I want you to take a close look at this response list here. Here's what happens with short-term stress. And here's what happens with long-term stress. Of the two, neither one of them is necessarily, well, let me rephrase that. Both of them are responsible for keeping us alive in stressful situations. They're absolutely critical to our well-being that we can respond this way. But we also can have pathological conditions or conditions that are not beneficial, such as an anxiety attack that would be produced by the release of epinephrine due to a stressful response that is disproportionate to what the actual threat is. Different things can trigger anxiety attacks um, and they produce the same response of glucose being released into our bloodstream, blood pressure going up, heart rate going up, respiratory rate going up, increased metabolic rate and changes in blood flow pattern and um, it can actually be quite scary when we have these anxiety attacks due to this massive release of epinephrine and the important thing there that I want to emphasize is that these anxiety attacks are due to a physiological response. It's not something that's just in your head. It is this massive dumping of epinephrine thanks to your autonomic nervous system. And I will remind you again that the autonomic nervous system is an involuntary system. You cannot control it. And so quite often we have this society, con this concept or this perception that people who have anxiety disorders just need to get a grip. They need to control themselves. They need to figure this out. You know, they need to get a grip somehow and, and stop freaking out and overreacting. And we have all these negative stereotypical ideas and expressions that are part of our culture that really have no business being there because these anxiety attacks are due to a massive release of epinephrine. Now, anybody can experience an anxiety attack and it, it often uh, surprises the person who's experiencing it. Somebody who may never have had one before can have one and it literally feels like you can't breathe, you can't get enough oxygen. It, it feels like you're going to die. The room closes in around you. It's, a, it's not a pleasant experience. And so this is, this is me, kind of my public relations speech in terms of mental health and the stigma that is associated with mental health in our society in our, in, uh, today and that it really needs to change. We need to understand that these anxiety attacks are regulated by our autonomic nervous system. Now that doesn't mean that we can't use cognitive therapy and behavioral strategies to help regulate that and prevent the anxiety attacks from happening. If we bounce right back up here to my diagram where I was doodling on the limbic system, um, I do want you to remind you that the limbic system, while the limbic system is an autonomic system, there is information that comes from our, our um, 
cerebral cortex, our executive centers, that can help process and regulate those. So cognitive therapy does benefit people who have anxiety disorders, who have experienced anxiety attacks. But we all need to understand that the actual attack itself, once it has begun, um, we can use all of the pull yourself together, man, or, or snap out of it, or all these negative terms, and we're not going to help. It's just not going to help. The person who's experiencing has to experience it and um, try to rein it in through some cognitive behavioral techniques. And we need to be compassionate and understanding to people who do suffer from these anxiety disorders. That's your stress response. Oh, yeah, I forgot to talk about all the unpleasant things that are associated. I talked about the unpleasant things associated with acute responses. Let's talk this long-term chronic response. <laughs> Weight gain, suppressed immune system. Uh, yeah, none of those are nice. We don't like those because they can cause us to get sick more easily. Um, and they can affect our blood glucose levels. So if we're diabetic, chronic stress is bad news. If we're pre-diabetic, chronic stress is bad news. Um, and so certainly we need to worry about the effects of chronic cortisol levels as well. I talked too long. I even ended up log it, logged out of my computer. Sorry, guys. <laughs>